Well, it's interesting coming here again. I remember the first time I came to this conference, we sat in a small auditorium. And as I look out now at the number of people who are here today, I think it's a real tribute to ISPA and to what they built in iWeek, now in its 10th year, as a really global internet conference to address policy and other issues. I have some bad news for you. I don't have a PowerPoint. You see, they asked me to speak about something different this time. They said, instead of talking about the status of internet in the US, which is, I guess, boring, um, or talking about government policy again this year, and, or getting into shouting matches with members of your government, this year they asked me to actually talk about how the internet has changed in 2011. Hence, I don't have a PowerPoint. Now, just to let you know, this is as inconvenient to me as it is to you. First of all, I'm going to have to wear these to read my notes. I haven't given a speech off notes in 15 years. And if you look around, you'll see I'm the only one here in a suit and tie. That's because when you show up to speak at a conference and you don't have a PowerPoint, well, how does anyone know that you know what the heck you're talking about? <laughs> I believe that power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> and so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the changes that have occurred in the internet in 2011, I'm going to talk about six areas. Government, government processes. I'm going to talk about the infrastructure, cyber crime and cyber war, privacy, intellectual property and content, and finally, the impact we've had on social norms and what that has meant in the last year. I have to tell you, that the last time we had a revolution like the internet was back in the 60s, at the dawn of what we now call the hippie era. How many of you were actually around? I see a lot of white hair. Okay, so you remember, we changed the world. We, brought, we, we taught people that they could hate war and love sex. What a grand thing to do. But I remember how painful it was back in 1978 at the end of, of the whole hippie movement to realize that what it had all come down to was disco. <laughs> disco music, staying alive, the Bee Gees, thank you, yeah. And I feel a little bit that way about the internet now. Now, I'm not here to bash the internet because we won. We set out in 1993 with the commercial internet to change the world. We said the internet will change everything, and indeed it has. But there's a small thing that we live with called the law of unintended consequences. And I think we have to, to admit that the internet has fallen victim to that, and I'm just going to give you a few examples. I think what needs to be said is that 2011 is the year when the pendulum began to swing when we realize that while we may have changed everything, we haven't changed everything in quite the way that we thought we would. And that there are, there are things that we need to examine very closely as we move now into what will soon be the third decade of the internet. Let's begin with governance. You see, we said that, that the internet would change democratic processes, and it has. If you look at just in the United States at the elections in 2006 and 2008, it's very clear that a candidate who is not capable of using the internet effectively is not going to get elected in the United States, not to a national office. So we've changed politics, but what we didn't realize is that the governments would strike back because governments do not like an element that is so critical to their survival over which they have no control. And so we have seen in the example Peter gave, for example, um, Egypt 
Had there not been internet connectivity in Egypt, you would not have seen the revolution that succeeded there. The government was able to shut down 88% of the internet in Egypt, but they weren't able to capture all the cell phones. Thank God for data plans, the revolution went forward. But this led a lot of other countries to begin to examine what they might have to do if they were in fact faced with a similar situation. Especially with the global economy turned downward as it is, there's a great deal of unrest. And so you're beginning to see now governments that are striking back. The internet kill switch legislation that was proposed in the U.S. is an excellent example of that. We've also seen what happened with WikiLeaks, which, depending on how you feel about open government, still, I think it has to be said, has done an incredible amount of damage. Diplomats could no longer negotiate with any confidence whatsoever that those negotiations will not show up on a website. And what that means is that all governments have to operate in a glass house, and I would submit that if you believe that's good for you, you may be just a little naive. There are some processes of government that need to be conducted privately, and while the results of those discussions need to be public and need to be examined publicly before they are implemented in any way, you cannot, you simply cannot expose people who give you information that you need in confidence if, in, if that exposure causes them to lose their life. That's not, that's not what we mean by transparency in government. What we're seeing now is that the internet, far from driving the kind of political processes we wanted it to drive, I'm sorry, I'm making you guys uh, work back there with the camera because <laughs> I keep moving back and forth. That's all right. It's a habit of mine. I can't stand still. So, rather than driving what we thought were going to be new eras of transparency, we're driving our governments further underground. And we're causing them to come back after us to create ways in which they can maintain control. The last time this happened, was with the advent of the printing press. The printing press is very interesting because they're forever trying to equate the, the great changes that came about with the Gutenberg printing press to what's happened with the internet. And there are a lot of parallels. Um, for example, if you go to most libraries, you will find an example somewhere or a reference to the Gutenberg Bible. And we're able to note that the advent of the printing press led to revolutions throughout Europe. Kingdoms fell because of the printing press. The power of the church crippled forever because the printing press put the Bible in the hands of the common person. All of which sounds wonderful and good and historical until you realize that the real social effect of the printing press was that it flooded Europe with cheap pornography. Sex drove the social changes as much as anything else. The infrastructure of the internet, we've talked a lot about the infrastructure in this country, in Argentina. Uh, we, we live and breathe infrastructure, all of us in the internet industry. And so it's a little disconcerting to realize that in this case, in this time, in the year 2011, we have a couple of realities that we have to um, address. The first is that IPv6 is going to take a while to get here. And the reason for that is, in spite of the proclamations, constant proclamations, that the internet is about to collapse from the sheer weight of, of not enough address space, and we sold the last address space, and it'll be so awful, somehow it keeps muddling along. And it will until we have an actual need, and then IPv6 will already be sitting there. But right now, today, to lose sleep over IPv6 is, I think, on your part and mine, uh, a little premature. The second reality we have to confront is that while definitely the future of the internet is going to be fiber optic and wireless, especially cellular, 4G cellular is a hoax. It does not exist. 
Anytime you hear a company promoting its 4G products, think in the back of your mind, liar. It's maybe 3.5G. What they did is they didn't actually have equipment that would meet the 4G spec. And so they went to the ITU and said to the ITU, oh, please, 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 because see, every two years, the cell phone industry has to redo their plans. And to redo their plans and get you to sign up again, they've got to have something new and bright and shiny, a little bobble. And they were two years out and had nothing new to offer. So they said, look, we don't really have 4G, but what we do have is like a little better than 3G. It's like 3.5G. So would you please let us call that 4G? And ITU said, oh, well, sure, why not? So now you have a marketplace flooded with 4G and discussions of 4G. And in the US, AT&T is busy convincing the government that with 4G, they will cover the entire country with broadband. <laughs> I don't know who they think they're kidding. They don't have the backhaul. They don't have enough cell towers to cover the country. The reality is the infrastructure is both good and bad. And, you know, I, I listen. Okay, I'm not going to step away. You can keep the camera there. I listen to people talking about how bad you have it for, for broadband in much of South Africa, throughout the African continent. And you say, it's not like you have it there in the U.S. Well, here's a word of caution for you. I don't have it that good in the U.S. And I run the Internet Association for the industry. Jack will tell you of his battles just to get Internet connectivity in the little town he lives. I live in a mountain valley town. It's remote. I do not live in a large city. And when I first moved there, my choice of broadband was, well, there wasn't one. Eventually, we got satellite, and then the phone company began to bring in DSL. And now we may have cable coming our way. They're actually thinking about building a fiber optic network through the county. Uh, they haven't started construction yet. But all of this has come about in the last four years. And beyond that, once we realize that the infrastructure has both pluses and minuses about it, we have to realize a bitter and grueling fact. In the U.S., where we can get a broadband signal to virtually every person in the country, some way, wireless, satellite, wired, cable, whatever, 34% of Americans are not using broadband. One out of three Americans. That's a lot. And we are just now beginning to learn that you can build all the infrastructure you want, but if you can't show people how relevant the internet is to their lives, they're not going to spend the money. And that is not unique to the United States. The same numbers haunt just about every internet-rich country. In Europe, where they like to brag about how much better their infrastructure is than in anyone else in the world, in places like Singapore and places like Korea and Japan, they're facing the same problem. Just because you build it does not mean that people will come to use it. And that, I would suspect, is going to be, as you move forward in South Africa and throughout the African continent, that is going to be your greatest challenge. What do you do when people don't come? Cybercrime and cyber war, I think Peter spoke of uh, pretty convincingly. I just want to point out that if you follow the semantic report, uh, the trend micro, micro report, uh, any of the various antivirus or security software companies, you're going to learn very quickly that crime is increasing online. Increasing dramatically at this point. There is virtually no major company in the world that has not suffered attacks. And interestingly enough, we're beginning to see more reports about it because for the first time, these attacks are having an economic level of damage that we've not seen in the past. 
It's not just a matter of telling the bank, we'll take your servers down if you don't pay us a million dollars. It's moved into active damage to the networks. And because of that active damage to the networks, it has become necessary for companies to insure their networks against that damage and the insurance companies are demanding as part of that insurance policy that all attacks be publicly reported. So you're seeing an increase in the number of reports. But you're also seeing an increase in the, uh, and a change in the way these attacks are mounted. They've moved from simply demanding protection money to a level of action that's unprecedented. We're also having to deal now with the entire concept of cyber war. A year ago, cyber war was theoretical. It no longer is. And what we're finding is the greatest challenge is not protecting the, the, the South African government servers from an outside penetration. It's protecting you and your servers. Because what we see in case after case is the entry point used by foreign governments when they commit cybercrime is not through the large ISPs, it's through the small ISPs. Because they know you don't have the security strength that the largest ISPs have. So, access there is going through small networks and that means that you become of importance in cyber war. You become the front line in cyber war, and that means you're going to come under additional government scrutiny again. In matters of privacy, I don't have to tell you that Twitter, Facebook, Google, YouTube, none of them have an effective uh, business model. None of them, in point of fact, have any way to make money except to reap and repackage and sell your subscribers' personal data. Your personal privacy comes at a very cheap price today. We have people who are not aware that everything that goes on to Facebook is the property of Facebook. Every photo you upload, every snippet of information is indexed and used. We used to believe that the greatest threat to our personal privacy was our governments. That they would track you everywhere you went. That they would know everything you did. They would feel what's in your head and what's in your heart and they'd be able to index it and they'd be able to turn it back and make use of it in ways that you may not want them to use it. And it turns out we were wrong. It wasn't the governments we needed to fear. It was the advertisers, the marketers. Privacy today virtually does not exist. I think Jack said that. It's absolutely right. And it's amazing because the U.S., for example, has no right of privacy built into its constitution. We didn't know we had to have it. Sure, there's a Fourth Amendment that says that we, we will be secure in our persons and, and places and papers, but it's not being applied. It was applied only to governments. It wasn't applied to marketers. So, anonymity on the Internet, the cornerstone of the Internet when we founded it 18 years ago, is gone. Cannot exist. And the ramifications of that we have not yet seen. There's also a war over content. Who's going to own the content? And I don't mean a little bit of content. I mean every piece of content. As Google attempts to buy up every library in the world. As the film studios attempt to keep control over all of the movies, the music industry, control over all the music. And what we're seeing, well, quite honestly, if we had lived through most of the centuries with the kind of copyright laws we have in effect today, you would never have heard of Shakespeare. There would be no Mozart. There would be no culture. We would have nothing because it would be locked in the vaults of a handful of companies who have no idea what to do with it. This is the interesting part. 
Most of the films created before 1939 are gone. They rotted on studio shelves because the studios would not release them to the public domain and would not preserve them. Efforts are underway to save them now, but who knows? And who knows what you'll be able to access? Who knows if libraries will even exist? Because content is the new currency of the internet. And social norms. Oh my word. Social norms, how things have changed. Let me tell you how things have changed. Right now, I can tell you that in a small town in western Virginia, there is a woman sitting in her pajamas watching me speak. Good morning, baby. <laughs> dictionaries have added emoticons. Smiley faces are in the dictionary. Who saw that coming? In schools, in schools in the United States, they are abandoning the teaching of handwriting. Within a few years, they will teach children to sign their name, maybe. Everything else will be done by keyboard. Then there's the tyranny of PowerPoint. And the reason I didn't bring a presentation today was so that for one brief gleaming moment, hopefully, you've stopped updating your Facebook pages and are actually listening to what I have to say. Okay, this is not true. I can look around and see that's not true, but I had that hope. <laughs> We've seen the decline of traditional media. Nearly every newspaper the world over is dying. Television is in full panic. The cable industry is in full panic as everything shifts to streaming media. And the thing is, we don't yet know what the ramifications of the social changes are going to be. How many of you have learned that you've broken up with your sweetheart by seeing on their Facebook page that they've changed their status from in a relationship to available? Uh, come on, I talked to some of you guys at the bar last night. You were very, pretty candid. You've been dumped that way. What does that do when we no longer interface with each other face to face? Where does that leave our society? And I'm not going to suggest that this is all negative. It's not. We're able to communicate in ways we could never communicate before, but you have to remember this. 25% of the general population is mentally ill. Okay, that's 43% if you live in the UK. Uh, don't ask me why they released that study. I didn't make it up. We know 7% of the population is severely psychotic. They cannot relate to reality. If you don't believe that, Go on to any forum and read the comments posted there. <laughs> so it's getting ugly. Unintended consequences. What we never envisioned happening. In the year 2011, we realized that this is finally the point at which the pendulum shifts a little bit. This is the year in which we realize that we've wrought both good and bad and that we have to begin to address in many ways the Pandora's box that we have opened. It's not all bad. We know we won the revolution. The internet, in fact, has changed everything. We have brought new capabilities to the world. We have brought a global economy, we have brought global communication, we have brought new opportunities for living and life and living better and living well. And we need to be proud of that accomplishment. But in many ways, this is like bringing a child into the world. As proud as you can be of that child for graduating from law school, you have to accept the fact that along the way, they're going to have some skin knees. They're going to drink out of your soda when they, you turn your back. 
They're going to get ill when you don't expect them to get ill, and they're going to need a lot of care and attention. What is the state of the internet in 2011? It's pretty good. How has it changed in the last year? Well, I would submit in the last year that reality has set in for all of us. We realize that with all the work we've done, we've perhaps paid attention to the wrong things. We've been thinking about wires and signals. We've been thinking about infrastructure. Now we must turn our attention and begin to think about humans and governments and our interrelationships with everyone else. I congratulate you for what you've done. I challenge you to continue the battle to change the world one internet connection at a time. Thank you.